first uh, a few words uh, about Simon, even though I believe everyone uh, knows you, I will say that you are the author of the Montessori Baby and of the Montessori Toddler book. Uh, you run parent and child Montessori classes and you operate a blog and podcast, uh, the Montessori Notebook. You are also a mom of two children. Do you want to add something? Um, I guess people will probably tell from my accent that I'm originally from Australia, but I've been living here in the Netherlands for the last uh, 16 years. And yeah, this is my adopted home. I really love it here. And I'm just really excited to get to share this topic of language for toddlers because we don't speak about it very often. It's kind of like everyone gets more interested in freedom and limits and you know other things like this, like how do I get my kids to listen? <laughs> um, and so to actually focus on language, I think is really exciting. So thank you for this opportunity to connect with you all. Perfect, perfect. Yes, uh, that's going to be the plan for today. Within the first 30, 40 minutes, uh, I would like to do this Q&A about language, because originally this Q&A was uh, supposed to be part of our Montessori beginnings course. And, uh, and Simon has recorded uh, a module about language. So this was supposed to be first um, only about language, but then we have decided to open this Q&A to everyone and also to open it to other questions, uh, not only about language, but about your toddlers and children. Uh, yeah, should I jump right into the questions that we have? Yeah, please do. Let's get started. <laughs> uh, uh, I would also like to encourage you guys to uh, write down questions in the chat, or later on we can also you can also you know wave your hand um, virtually. Wave your hand. I wouldn't see you if you would be really waving into the camera, but uh, wave your uh, hand and uh, you can just say the question out loud on the video. So I will start with the questions about language. Very often we do uh, get these questions where parents get worried, you know, like my child is already one and a half, two years old, and uh, he speaks only a few words or he doesn't speak at all. Uh, should I be worried? Usually is the, um, you know, is the question directly asked. Yeah, I think that it's always a worry for families because I can say from personal experience, I have my two children are now 22 years old and 20, and they turn 21 next week. And um, when Oliver was small, he didn't have a lot of words. Um, he understood a lot. I knew that he was taking everything in. Um, but then I went and like babysat for one of our friends and her child was exactly the same age as Oliver and he was speaking almost it felt like in sentences and I was thinking oh, Oliver says so little and for that moment I had that little panic I guess like oh he's not developing in that right way and then I realized actually this is a gift because if that's what Millie can say this is what Oliver wishes he could say and it just gave me an insight into the toddler brain and how much they're already taking in so when you hear someone who maybe has a lot of words around one year or one and a half years then don't get discouraged if your child's not at the same level but think this is what my child is likely also wanting to express and can't say it yet so that would be the first thing that I would say it's a natural kind of thing then we love to put on our Montessori observation glasses to look at it really matter of fact, because sometimes we think they don't say anything. Um, and so it's nice to just objectively write down how they communicate, what nonverbal communication do they have, um, what languages do you have in your home, which words they have in each language. Because if they've got more than one language, which might come up in some of our questions about raising bilingual or multilingual children, is that you might find that they have five words in this language and five words in this language which doesn't sound like a lot overall but that's still 10 words and so it's the same as a child a monolingual child of 10 words um, and so we have to kind of take into consideration that sometimes the input takes a little bit longer with bilingual and multilingual families but then they'll be very clear on having two or three or however many languages you have um, so that can also be something to take into consideration as well and then the third thing to say is, is if you have a concern it really 
I don't think you should be ashamed to go and get the support. We often have early childhood centres, um, depending on which country you're living in, where you can go and have a check and they can refer you to someone, a language specialist, if they also have a similar concern. And it's good to be proactive because the earlier you detect something, then the earlier you can get some help. And otherwise they just say, well, let me help you with this bit and this bit, and then you can go on your way. So it's not a problem to do that at all as well. So I think um, you need to have uh, like a speaking apparatus, you know, that works. So you could also check that the vocal things are working. You need a hearing apparatus that works. Um, and so you could get their ears checked, particularly if they've had a lot of ear infections and things like that. So they're two parts of the body. And I should say up front that we're talking mostly about um, children who can hear, um, who don't have um, a hearing deficit. Um, in today's workshop, um, but it is definitely worth following dads like um, you had um, Ashton as one of the talk, uh, talks in one of the conferences, Hi Lucy, um, and so you can follow people like that to get more information about um, ASL and things like that if you'd like that kind of information. So yeah, I think every child is unique and will develop at their own pace. Oh, one last thing to add is, is that there's so much happening around one year old. They're, either, they're learning to walk and they're learning to talk, right? At the same kind of time. And one usually takes off while the other one plateaus. So if they're a really you know, confident walker or they're moving a lot, then their language may take longer to develop. But likewise, the other way around is if, if they're not so interested in doing their gross motor work, then the language often takes off. So know that it takes so much neurological effort for both movement and language to take part, but one often takes over at a certain point and then the other one will catch up. Okay, I think that's maybe enough to get us started on that question. Yeah, and it usually goes also with the question of how can I encourage my child's language development at home? You know, what kind of activities can I do with the child at home to, uh, to support the language development? Yeah, um, I think before I even get into the activities I do, I think time would be the thing that I would say is the most important because we're all short of time. And I think language can be a thing that we don't spend enough one-to-one -one time looking in their eyes, making contact, slowing down their efforts to speak to really encourage them. So time might be at a premium, but I always think, I learned from my own mistakes, I guess, is that I was often so busy um, trying to like change a diaper really quickly and then get back to playing because I thought that's where the real work was being done. But those moments of care, if you've read any of like the Monster Toddler and the Monster Baby, you'll learn that the moments of care when you're diapering, when you're working in the kitchen together, um, when you're getting ready to leave the house, when you're walking outside and those kind of moments, they're perfect moments for language um, because you've got like less distractions, you've got their attention. And when they're concentrating on little activities like doing some fine motor work or some art and things, that's when we don't want to really speak too much because we want to, like, we don't want to break their concentration. So then it's really important to make sure that our other moments are really rich with language. Um, and that's the word that I use often is rich language. So when I'm speaking with a toddler, I don't like to, I might use more of a sing song tone but I'm not using baby talk, like kind of saying, there's a woof woof. Um, or if they like to say, I love you, I don't say, I love you back, because I want to be a beautiful example of what they're going to be absorbing. We talk about the absorbent mind in one story all the time. And so they're absorbing our language and how we say things. So yeah, I think um, I would say beautiful language, rich language, use proper names. If you know the name of a Labrador or the name of the um, West, West Highland Terrier, then give them those names or say, oh, actually the name of that bird, let's go and look that up and you can make a note to actually give them all those rich language. I had um, a toddler in class today and he's now just on the other side of three and um, he really always loves animals and they have a book with all the Latin names as well. And he actually knows the Latin names of these animals because he's so, yeah, that's it's amazing what they can actually absorb. Um, yeah, so activities that they can also do would be then, so conversation is probably our biggest one. Um, books, of course. And then we often have nomenclature baskets, which the easier name that I use is vocabulary baskets. And you can make them around a classified theme. So for example, all dogs in a basket, and then you can even eventually have a picture of the dog. So they learn that a 2D picture is the same as a 3D object. 
One question here in the chat is, how many languages should we expose the child to? We have many languages being spoken here in India. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, so I always refer to a bilingual specialist who used to come and do workshops in my classroom and her name's Eowyn Chrisfield. I'll type that in the chat because it's a funny spelling. And she's written a book and it's about language planning. And often we don't think about how we're going to plan our languages. We just think, let's do it. <laughs> and, and when you make a plan, you basically think about how many languages and what are my goals for those languages? And that's an interesting thing to think about because you just think that you want them to be multilingual, but actually what does it mean to be multilingual? It means that, does it mean that they can do supermarket shopping in that other country? Or does it mean that they can speak with family? Does it mean they want to study in that language? So if you want to eventually study in that language, it's called a literacy language, and you need to spend up to 30% of your week um, absorbing that language. So if you do the calculation, that means you probably have be able to acquire three literacy languages in those early years um, or going to plan them. You know, it depends on the input and things like that. So then look at the waking hours, map out how many hours you are awake, um, the child's awake, how many hours of the English, how many hours of, you know, each of the different languages they have in India and see, um, yeah, how you could make 30% fit. So here in the Holland, for example, um, in the Netherlands, you might have a Dutch speaking father and an English speaking mother. And that might be that the English speaking mother, they have at least over 30% of the time together and the Dutch as well. But because they live here, they often get more input in the Dutch and less in the English. So then maybe you want to get a babysitter who would be speaking English with them. And you might want to make sure that you have good English books because they're going to get more access to Dutch books that you, um, or maybe a neighbor can speak English and can read books with them and things like that. Just thinking how can, or we have play dates with other English speaking families so they don't think it's a secret language. So I'd say roughly three would be like the literacy languages or maybe two with other, you know, other ones. But I know from families I've worked with who have got Indian background, they actually mix their sentences quite a lot, like half of it's in English and half of it's um, using one of the Indian languages. So, um, it's not quite as pure, I guess, as we would say, because we like to try and keep one person, one language or a domains of youth approach. Another question was, how can I improve my child's language? I think that you have already answered that as well. Say about that, if you actually want to correct them, I think that's something to like mm -hmm. improve. I'm not sure if maybe they mean that as well, because if they, the child makes a mistake, uh, we often want to correct them and say, oh, no, you don't say that, you say this. Particularly, they get might get mixed up saying I, and they say you instead, because it's, that's a really hard one for them to pick up. And instead, in Montessori, we have a phrase that is teach by teaching, not by correcting. And so, again, we're like observation. And so we make a note, okay, they're mixing these ones up. And so then I'll teach it again at another time. So the other thing I like to do is if they say, um, mama, go home. And I want to say, yeah, mama went home. And so I would just then conjugate it in the correct way in a sentence that's back. It's not saying, no, don't say go, you say went, you know, or anything like that. Or if they say um, tomorrow or yesterday, they just might mean any time in the past or yesterday and any time in the future. And I don't necessarily, I would just like use it correctly in the next sentence, but I wouldn't actually say, no, 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 don't say that. And instead just keep modeling when um, until they pick it up. From Christy, my daughter is bilingual. I would like to introduce the language materials in both languages. Mom is English and dad is Albanian. Should I introduce English first and then Albanian, for example, with the movable alphabet? Um, I would have like the English speaker in your family do speaking English and do the language and work in English. And I would get um, the dad in this situation doing the Albanian. I think that would be the clearest to have it differentiated. And maybe that's more difficult with time and things. It would also depend on like what um, Eowyn says about learning reading and writing in the languages that if you're just at a one language school, that usually they will learn the language at school first and then that extra language they'll learn after. But the mother tongue, we want to keep strong all the time because that might be the base language. So for here in um, the Netherlands, um, you speak, uh, we had an English speaking family, right? And but the children were learning Dutch at school. And so then it's a priority to learn the Dutch learn reading. And then they just naturally pick up the English reading after that. So um, 
you can you can be proactive and do movable alphabet or you can let the school do the teaching and you support um we haven't really talked about um the approach for language beyond three years old but i guess to say that you do learn to write before you read in montessori and so what this question refers to is the movable alphabet which enables a child because when you read you have to be able to sound out the letters and then synthesize them into one word which is kind of like three steps, sound it out, synthesize, so you, yeah, you recognize the letter, sound it out and synthesize. And with, with writing, you can just say M and you can write down M and then A, ah, A, ah, and you can spell it right. You might spell it wrong, but you're making the sound and then M, and then you M, uh, M is mum. So you, instead with the movable alphabet, they can go get the letter M and they can put it down and A ah, and M and they've written it before they've been able to write and um, read it. And I think that's actually just like a beautiful, like following the child's way to learn to read, um, which is why we love to use the phonetics. And one thing that we can do at home, even if your child doesn't go to Montessori school, is to play the I spy game, you know, so that you can say I spy with my like something beginning with B. And if you just have a ball on the table, they gradually get the that, that kind of I spy game where it's really easy. And also you can use the sounds. So, for example, I was playing I spy in the car with my kids. And I went, I spy with my life. It starts with tr. And uh, I thought was thinking of tree, and um, my daughter went traffic light, and I went, I guess it could be traffic light. And I was just like blown away because it was like far more difficult than I even expected. So that's something that um, you could practice a lot at home is the ice bike. Game.